Um, all right, yeah, so just sort of from the top, I, I mean, I think uh, I sort of started this thing as a, a bit of a satire on the whole Zoom thing. It's a, a little technology that we've all learned to, to love and hate. Um, personally, not, not a huge fan of it, but I thought it was a, a good way to connect with a bunch of people um, who I probably wouldn't be able to otherwise in a traditional podcast format and just gather as much sentiment as I could about what's going on in the real estate space and beyond um, as a result of COVID and now all of the other interesting changes that are evolving in the world. Um, and so I, I, I'm really happy to have you on here and uh, just wondering if you could do a quick intro on sort of what you're doing right now and, and uh, you know, what you do in general. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's my pleasure. It's good to finally connect Likewise, yeah. I've gotten, uh, via Twitter for quite a while. I've been yeah. a big fan of some of your analysis as well. So uh, maybe for your viewers who don't know me, um, my name is Ben Rabideau. I run a small research firm. Um, we work with institutional investors. So uh, typically that would be pension funds, mutual fund companies, hedge funds, uh, sovereign wealth funds, endowments. Uh, and my role is uh, to try to think about the big picture macro trends in the Canadian economic landscape uh, with particular focus on things like housing and credit, uh, it's particularly consumer credit. So I spent a lot of time thinking about where the risk might lie. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's funny, you spend your, your whole career thinking about risk and then along comes something that nobody saw, which is this global pandemic. But, you know, in some ways, it, uh, you may not have seen that coming, but it's one of those things where we've been talking for quite a while about, uh, when I say we, I mean the media and myself, and you know, I know you were involved in discussions as well, just around some of the vulnerabilities on yeah. the consumer side in housing. And so it's going to be interesting to see how the next uh, year or so plays out, because if ever there was a time that some of those vulnerabilities could really come to the surface, like it's now for sure. Yeah. Yeah. How do you see that evolving sort of like given where we were at the onset of this? I mean, understanding that, you know, the Canadian debt scenario didn't really look as, as optimal for, for the arrival of something like this. I, I think it was probably the worst timing for us, but I guess the reality was there was a wall somewhere and, and it didn't look like we were, it looked like we kept just, you know, building ladders over it, let's say. Um, is this kind of going to force us to, to get it together? Or are we just going to use the same systems to perpetuate through it? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it's one of the million dollar questions. I think, so my, my take at this point, and this is, I think at this point, you, it's good to have opinions and convictions on things and, and how this could play out. But I think you have to hold them pretty loosely because the reality is that, you know, when you think about a normal distribution of potential outcomes, right, you can kind of have like a base case Well, here's how we think the next year might look. And you've got a distribution of outcomes all might be worse and might be better. And it's sort of, you know, your, your distribution is normally you know, you, you got a fairly thin distribution, nothing, but, but right now, you know, the way I'm thinking about it is just, there, there's so much that could happen in the next year. And so much is going to depend on the magnitude of fiscal support from the government. Right. Uh, and as well from the lenders, right? Like, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen. There is a legitimate concern around this deferral cliff, right? We know that yeah. there's about 15% of all mortgages in the country that have been deferred right now. Uh, that's not going to be forever. Right. Yeah. So, you know, at best you were talking about a six month deferral. Right. And, and already we're seeing that, uh, you know, the numbers from the Canadian Bankers Association are starting to come down in terms of the numbers that are, that are in deferral. I don't think that's a reflection of people who are starting to pay their mortgage voluntarily. I think that's a reflection of lenders starting to say, okay, you've had your, you know, three months, let's start to figure something out. And yeah. so a lot of that's going to depend. I mean, the, the range of potential outcomes is enormous. I'm inclined yeah. to think that um, there will probably be some structural changes that come out of this. I mean, I, I have to think that you know, we've been running a savings rate in Canada that's been between two and three percent for the last yeah about five years. Which, and what's interesting is when you net out pension in, yeah. entitlements from that. Um, so, so the government when they calculate uh, savings, they also will include changes in pension entitlements. Okay. Right. So your your savings into CPP, for example. Right. Well, that's not liquid savings. That's not. No. I mean, it's savings, but it's not the sort of savings that. You know, if you lose your job, it's liquid and you can have it there, right? So what's been interesting is that when you net out pension entitlements, the savings rate's been negative for, right. for a number of years, right? And so, and, and if you contrast that with the U.S., the U.S. has been running anywhere kind of 6 7% savings rate. And we've kind of got this attitude in Canada like, oh, those crazy American neighbors to the south, you know, we, yeah. we're much more prudent than them. We didn't blow ourselves up in 08, 09. I don't know. I don't know. I, it's hard to see that when you look at the leverage, David, and you look at savings rate. 
I have to think that coming out of this, people will do a serious rethink about how much money they should have set aside. There'll be a rethink around, you know, the sort of things that we've learned we can live without, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I just don't think that say that the consumer spending is going to come back the way that it was. I think it's going to take a long time and that the, and that savings rate is going to be a big part of that. So there will be some structural changes. The reason I think that matters is when you look at the Canadian economy over the last five years and you look at where real GDP growth has come from, it's been almost 90% consumer spending and residential investment, residential investment being uh, the construction of new houses, renovation of existing structures, and then uh, ownership transfer costs. So your legals right. and your realtor fees and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so those two things have driven by far the lion's share of GDP growth. So right. it, we're into a new world now in Canada. And, and if that's true, that this is a fundamental sort of structural change, it's not clear to me what picks up the baton and drives growth going forward. Right. I've actually had a, a similar perspective, like, you know, that, that how, ha, ha, you know, the, the what's evolving as such a, a key role in our GDP is basically not even the export of anything, but actually the import of, of people to consume that housing. Right. And it, it seems like it's such a, it's a challenging position to be in when something like this happens where, you know, you have vulnerabilities to, like you said, like, I, I guess at, at what point does it become systemic where there's so many risks associated with what we're, what is a, a big core driver in our, in our economy, you know, with, uh, immigration being challenged by just travel restrictions, not only, and then also, you know, the foreign capital flows. Um, and then, you know, w once you start stacking everything else on top of it, uh, the yeah. domestic picture doesn't look exceptionally good either. Right. Well, let me, let me talk a bit about immigration. Cause I think you hit the nail on the head. People I think have underappreciated how important uh, population growth generally yeah. has been in Canada in the last few years. So to put it in perspective, if you look over the last I don't know, five quarters or so, um, real GDP growth per capita has been more or less flat, right? right? And so the, the economic growth that we've been seeing is really a function of this incredible population growth that, that was as high as 1.7, 1.8%, which is, I don't know, 50 year highs. We can't, I mean, we're talking, you know, generational type, type highs in population growth. Um, now, what's really interesting, and again, when you get into sort of my wheelhouse, which is thinking about, well, where are the risks within the narrative? What are, what are people missing that are the vulnerabilities, right? And I was making the argument back in 2018 that there's a very serious risk within the structure of population growth that people are missing. And it's this. So population growth in, in, in Canada is really a function of three things. It's number one, it's your, the natural increase in the population. So call that, you know, Canadians that are here making new Canadians, right? And, and that's actually just bumping along all time lows. So you're talking between 95 and 100,000 year over year is what, is what we're seeing for natural increase. Number of births minus the number of deaths sort of thing. Uh, and so that's, a, that's, a, that's one, it's a relatively small component. Secondly, you've got net international migration, so, inter, so immigration uh, on a permanent basis. And there you, you've got about 340,000 people coming in every year. But then you lose about 70,000. So there are some expats that leave and go other places. And so it nets out to about, call it 250, 270, right? But the third component is what everyone is missing, and it's non-permanent residents. Right. Okay? And so this is foreign students, work permit holders, and some refugees. Uh, and normally, that is a rotating door. There's some quarters where it goes up. There's other quarters where you see outflows, right? right. Uh, and uh, what we've seen instead over the last few years is just this incredible increase in the non-permanent resident cohort to the point where it, they now represent over 3% of the entire Canadian population, and they're almost 40% of nominal population growth. Now, the reason that that matters, and that's a long-winded way to say this, this is the important point. Historically, during recessions, those numbers go negative. Right. So that that group actually shrinks traditionally during recessions. And the reason that it shrinks, and it's sort of intuitive, is that the idea of the work permit holder, the program is structured to bring labor in when the labor market is very tight. Right. When employers are like, hey, I need to I need guys working in my factory. I need people over here doing this. I can't find people locally. And the government's like, no problem. If you need to bring people in from abroad, we'll give them a work permit to do that. 
Okay. But you need to show us generally that you can't fill the need domestically. There's other programs that are more strategic and kind of meant to meet the long-term needs. But in terms of just the work permit component, it's designed to expand when the labor market's tight. But then when you get into recession and there are job losses and the unemployment rate rises, it's designed to shrink. And so what's happening now is, you know, with the unemployment rate now into the teens, the demand for foreign workers is going to be decimated, right? And, and not only that, but if you think about what's happening with all the higher education institutions in September, most of them are moving to online. So it's not clear to me that the 500,000 foreign students in Canada are coming back in September to take a Zoom class and pay living expenses when they could right. be taking a Zoom class from home. And already what we're hearing, and maybe you can, I don't know if you're hearing it, but I, from the property managers that I'm speaking with, they're already reporting that yes, they're seeing uh, foreign students that are saying they're not coming back in September and they're canceling their leases. So you know, get throw all those things in the pot. And I actually think the population growth is gonna be surprisingly weak in the next year. Right. It's interesting because like, I, I think that there's, at least on the bank side with those economists, it seems like they want to present the data that, that things are okay. Um, I think applications are steady, but, but we're not actually seeing any real migration. Um, anecdotally, I, I, I know a couple of the groups that I worked with uh, during my tenure at Guelph, um, I was with a couple of property management groups there. Um, when I was a student, I was in the real estate faculty. Um, there's, there's definitely some cancellations going on. Um, Guelph wouldn't be a huge one for, a, for an international populace. I think they're sort of just getting into that game. But places like Kitchener-Waterloo, I, I've heard of, of extreme suffering. And that was a saturated student rental market to begin with. And, and, and one of those markets where, from a price growth perspective, things got really, like they really accelerated after the, uh, the foreign ownership tax went into place in the Greater Golden Horseshoe. A lot of that capital seemed to get ported outside of the, the, the horseshoe and into some of those more stable sub-markets. Um, and that one would be one where there was definitely a, what most would call an excess supply in the student rental side. So, and I've, there, I've definitely heard of a lot of, uh, of bad situations out there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, beyond that, I mean, it's, it's tougher to see, it's, it's really tough to quantify, right? Um, until, until it actually hits and until you start seeing. And I think a lot of this is like, it, it, it's a lot of those looming questions. When the deferrals run out, who's going to be able to pay their mortgage? When curb runs out, who's going to be able to, to pay their mortgage? And, and I, don't, I don't really know the answer to that question, but I, I can say like on the, on the bad end of the, the, on the, the worst case scenario, like you said, if you take your base case, your best case, and your worst case, the, the worst case scenario of that looks really, really grim from my perspective. Yeah, well, I think that's exactly, you're right. I think that's exactly the point that we don't know. And to, to that point, like, you know, so my, my, uh, my thinking is that people are going to be surprised at how weak population growth comes in. Yeah. The next year. Now, is, are there things the government could do to try to offset that? Yeah, there are. There are. For sure there are. And that would absolutely change the, the calculus. But, yeah, the thing we're going to run into on that front that is one of the other sort of big dynamics that we see during recession. Well, there's actually a couple, but one of the big ones is the the politics tend to change as it relates to immigration. Like it was interesting. There's a handful of surveys that came out mid last year um, from the big survey companies. Um, I mean, Nanos and uh, um, I mean, who are some of the other ones? Ipsos. Ipsos. Yeah. Thank you. That's the one I was thinking of. Uh, and they were measuring Canadian sentiment around current immigration levels. And they were finding even then that there was a record number of Canadians that were uneasy with immigration levels. Now, this is not a commentary about whether they're right or wrong, but, but what my point is just that that was with the labor market at like multi-generational tightness, right? Like it was with, you know, an extremely low unemployment rate, yeah. right? And now you're heading into an environment where the unemployment rate's probably going to be double digits well into 2021. Right. Uh, one of the things we tend to see in those environments is people go, listen, why are you bringing in all these people? And again, I'm not saying this is the right way to think about it, but this is the way people think. They're like, why are you bringing in all these people when I don't have a job, right? And my kids don't have a job. Yeah. And the politics change, they just do. And I, you know, it's going to be hard. It's, it's, it's an open question whether this current government is going to have the fortitude to make those sort of decisions that could cost them politically. Right. So I don't know. I mean, that's one thing. The other thing that concerns me about the rental market is, I mean, you've got you've got the Airbnb and B effect, the Airbnb effect. 
uh, in which you're seeing some migration of the long-term rental pool out of the short-term rental pool. But I think that's going to be relatively, you know, a, a temporary phenomenon. That's not going to drag on for yeah, you know, years, right? But it could be for the next couple quarters, you see sort of a slow bleed out. out of it. The bigger concern is, um, the other thing that happens in recessions is you get the household formation rate just, just slows yeah. dramatically, right? So as a good example, if you think about, well, there's actually, there was a couple articles over the weekend you know, the one was about this poor, I think you might, you probably saw it, the, the realtor who got dinged with a $30,000 yeah, yeah. fee from TD to break her mortgage. And you're like, well, boo-hoo, whatever. But, but, but the, the story within that story is that, you know, she had this house that she was renting out. She had two, two uh, people that were renting rooms and one that was uh, used as a short-term rental. And both of the people that were renting her house went back home, yeah. right? And left it, left it vacant, yeah. right? And then there was another article I think this one was out, out of uh, maybe out of the, the, the Globe and Mail, but it was talking about um, how you're seeing all these students move back home right now, yeah. right? And it makes total sense. So you take like, okay, so you think about the normal cycle. You've got, let's say you've got, you know, you're in school, you've got a, a, a couple of roommates, you're done, you graduate, you go, you get your first job, you, get, you, you buy a condo or you move into your, and you rent a condo on your own, right? And so, and so, you know, three people who were roommates together, now all of a sudden go out and they create three new households effectively, right? And it's, it's, it's increased demand for housing in that, in that environment. Yeah. Today, what you've got is they're graduating and, and the job market is so crappy and, you know, no one wants to buy or rent a house right now, but they're just moving back in with their parents. They're just going to wait this out and see how things go. Yeah. And so the, the household formation rate slows dramatically. So you've got all of these dynamics. I actually think, and I know this is extreme, view but there's a chance that in the next year net rental demand could be zero like between like i think there's a chance that population growth could come in pretty close to zero all right and and if you know the household formation rate slows dramatically you know i just don't see where this rental demand is going to come from i would agree with that completely like i uh I can speak to it, you know, just based on my age, I get a lot of people who will respond to like my Instagram stories and stuff and ask me, you know, what should I do if I just got laid off and I can't pay my rent? And I'm like, T take the hit on the last month's rent, try and be polite and give your landlord as much notice as possible and move back in with mom and dad. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the, the people from my generation, they're living in the city and paying extreme rent and mom and dad are subsidizing it anyway. And, and now mom and dad might not have, you know, stable employment or whatever it is. And, and they're going to go back, like you said, like, and I, 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 I was trying to talk, like have that dialogue a lot on Twitter. And it seemed like it was kind of over a lot of people's heads because it was a little bit too anecdotal, but I would say like any millennial, anybody in the millennial generation who doesn't own right now, it doesn't make any sense for them to, to like, there's no, I think that there's an erosion of the advantage of, of, of proximity of urbanization of, and, 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 I, I could definitely see what you're describing happen. And even just with the evidence that I have within, within my generation of, you know, new grads who are working entry level, like there's already, you know, enough uh, real empirically verifiable data that things are, you know, that, that the layoffs are affecting lower incomes. But I don't think that that's just like unskilled labor. I think it's entry level positions, right? And I think that I see a lot of people who are, in knowledge work who are in in good industries that that hypothetically shouldn't be impacted by this that are getting you know when when the companies start to trim the fat and and protect the bottom line it's that's where i, I see a lot of that happening and i could see a lot of those people going back home for sure i've seen it already i would say yeah that's interesting that's it yeah and i do wonder whether there will be sort of a second wave that's you know more the middle management because uh, right. you're right you look at the employment numbers and it's incredibly skewed towards the job losses that is are incredibly skewed towards the service sector and relatively low paying. Well, it's interesting. You saw that average wages actually spiked last right. month, right. right? Which is a function of all of these low, relatively low paying jobs being lost. Yeah. Uh, and, and the, the higher income jobs staying relatively stable and the net effect is average wages jump, which is like the last thing you'd expect to see in a, right. in a recession like this. But I do, I do worry that, you know, given a bit of time that those job losses won't trickle down to kind of middle management and beyond. Right. There's uh it's hard to know how many how many businesses are actually going to open coming back out of this. Right? It's, I mean, uh, that's the challenge, really, right? It's like if, if you if you think about that on, on the extreme negative side, it, it would we would almost we would have to end up in basically a, a Great Depression 2.0 if 
if a, if if as many of them that are closed right now stayed closed like there's no our economy just wouldn't it wouldn't look even remotely the same and that's when it starts to get really really concerning right it's like and, and what what can stimulus actually do to to restart things like that like in the service sector in hospitality yeah. etc right yeah i mean I, i'm with you i think um i do think the vast majority will come back but it's a matter of magnitude right like so if you look at okay so if we use the the the, the serb benefits right canada uh, emergency response benefits is sort of a proxy so the last time i checked it which was earlier this week it was 8.3 million canadians that were receiving right. serb benefits so that means you've got 8.3 million Canadians out of a labor force that, that at one point was about 20 million is down to somewhere around 18. Um, so that's, you know, 40 to 45% of the labor force right now that's, that's receiving that has either been laid up or has seen some sort of an impact on their, their employment. So now if you assume that 95% of those jobs come back and at this point that could be, that could be generous, but let's assume it's 95%. That still wipes out two years of employment. Right. <laughs> Like that's, I mean, the numbers here are just so insane. Like that, that, that alone, if 95% come back, this is still a severe recession, right? And it's not clear that 95% are coming back. Do you think that there's a, a further extension of that, that like a lot of, like I've heard of, uh, you know, some economists claiming that this is just the end of unskilled labor. Like that basically the, the incentive to replace a lot of this stuff with automation has never been greater. We have the tools. A lot of it was just, you know, really, social good that they were like a lot of these zombie companies etc um is there a chance that we that we don't see unskilled labor return and that you know the serb perpetuates and becomes a universal basic income or is that like an extreme yeah. i've wondered i've wondered that so i do think they're gonna have to do something they're gonna have to they're gonna have to extend these benefits they can't just cut you know they can't cut these people off right i mean you've got employment insurance i'm not sure how the transition goes between CERB and employment insurance, I think you still qualify for regular EI benefits after your yeah. CERB runs out. Uh, and so that can carry you through for a while, provided that you, you qualify. But yeah, I have to think in the next year, we're going to see tremendous fiscal support. They just can't, yeah. we're going to have to see things that we've never seen before, right? Yeah. Um, I, I don't think we're at the point yet where, where we see this just become just a universal basic income. Um, but I don't know. This is the sort of time in history you see these massive changes in, in, in policy that yeah. this is the time you could see something like that. Uh, on the automation front, I don't know. That's not really my, my wheelhouse. I don't, I, I think that the trend towards automation, I, you know, I think most people that I, I think highly of in this space, uh, especially in the tech space. So I don't know if you ever listened to Kara Swisher or Scott Galloway. I think they're great, but they, their point is often that, you know, COVID-19 is an accelerant in a lot of ways, right? And, and all of the trends that were already in place are just being magnified dramatically, right? So, you know, one example is, is e-commerce, which in the U.S., I mean, it's been slower to penetrate in Canada, but in the U.S., it's been gaining since it took off in 2000. It's been like, you know, 1% a year market share they're capturing, right? right. So by the time you get into, heading into 2020, you're, you know, you're pushing 20% of the market share is e-commerce. Well, in the last couple of months, all of a sudden it's close to 30%, right. right? It's just, and so, you know, all of these trends in tech, I think are being accelerated. And, and that actually brings me to something I wanted to ask you about. Yeah. You know, so when this all started, this being the COVID lockdowns and everything else, there was sort of this view that like, this is it for, you know, um, office uh, buildings and yeah. uh, a lot of the, you know, the, the high density, uh, urban living, people are going to be looking to move away from that. Uh, there is going to be a push towards uh, work from home that's going to be permanent. And at first, my reaction was like, okay, like everything else, everyone's reaction when you see something like this is like, this will change the world. And I, I remember, I remember so clearly 9-11, watching the, the towers come down. And I so vividly remember everyone being like, the, the world's never going to be the same. It's just, all these things are going to change. And for months, that's all we were talking about. And then you fast forward a year and it's like, nothing's changed, right? right? And, and so at first my thinking was like, okay, this is just gonna be like that. Everyone's gonna freak out. There's gonna be all these predictions about how the world's gonna change. And a year from now, we'll be like, back to how it was. Now I'm not so sure. Now I'm starting to wonder as this drags on and, and it becomes clear that this is having a serious 
you know, effect on people's psyche and how they're thinking about the world. And, and more to the point that you're seeing these businesses now coming out and saying, hey, this work from home thing is working for us and we're going to allow more of our workforce to do this. Now I'm starting to wonder if this actually has some merit. So, you know, you, you spend a lot of your time in, in the northern parts of the GTA. What, what are you seeing out there? It's a tough one. I uh, I would say it seems to be pretty well split right down the center. But it, I would say that the people who are optimistic towards the recovery of the traditional office tower and financial core are ones that would have a bias. Whereas it's harder to to parse for that bias on on the work for home work from home side of things. Um, I, I can't see it disappearing. Like I mean, just functionally, it's too important of a of a component to our economy like if you trickle that down i mean it, it, you would understand well from your work with pension funds like if you know a lot of the asset holders of, of some of these office towers that are now going to be empty if if if, the, if that disappears that means that a lot of people's returns on their pensions are, are coming in and that means that you know there's there's further suffering down the line that that creates a greater problem and that's where i think policy is going to be they're going to do their the best that they can to address that that piece of it. I think from a from a consumer sentiment perspective, it, it's it's almost right down the center. I would say 50-50. A lot of people want to get back to the financial core. They miss the the social aspect, the belly to belly work. I'm not a huge fan of it. If I like, I, I worked from home as much as I could before, um, but but I think that it's it's really it's, it's going to be interesting. And I, I do think that I think we're going to eventually be able to quantify whether or not the productivity is better or worse. Um, and that will start maybe the decision making process. I would say in the, the challenge is that like with nine 11, it was a single event and it, and it, and it ended. And then it was easier to kind of piece things back together afterwards. Whereas this is an ongoing thing and you know, there's a vulnerability to a second wave. And I know you've been doing a ton of research around the, the COVID, um, you know, the, the, the metrics there. Um, but if we see that, then, I mean, realistically, there's no way that we can go back to a normal working life until we've got a vaccine. Even like, I, I've seen a lot of groups posing, I've even heard it so much as, you know, some groups saying that there'll be a net increase in demand in office space because the, per, the square feet per individual is, is higher, the demand. So you, cause you need more space because people got to be far apart from one another, but I don't know if I see that either. That, that feels like a stretch. That I know. Feels like a stretch. Yeah. But yeah, who knows? Who knows? Yeah. You know, it's one of the, uh, underestimating the resiliency of just Canadian companies and the Canadian consumer has been just such a bad idea for so many years. But yeah, yeah. You know, I, I do think, you know, if ever there was a time where it's different, like this could be it. There's just so yeah. much. I, I'm with you. I'm yeah. with you. I would I, say on the investment side, though, like there's really, I, 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 and maybe it's a bias because these guys have to think this way. To believe in the in the projects that they're working on but most of the office guys that that i'm working with are still full steam ahead uh, we have a couple of uh, brick and beam conversions in, in in toronto sort of like your uh fringe core stuff um so like central toronto um still full steam ahead financing's not that big of an issue i mean commercial credits tightened in general but i'd say on the development side the absorption risk is a bigger concern for commercial lenders on on res like on your condo developments etc um with with traditional stuff office uh, industrial i mean they're almost just assuming that things are going to go back to normal and and a one to two year let's say pause in in your pro forma in like a, in, a, in a deal that's modeled on a 25 to 30 year horizon it's not a huge deal it, it i think the problem arises if if this takes a lot longer to solve than one or two years right yeah now that's interesting so you're you're not seeing any issues in financing on uh the office and commercial side but you are seeing lenders just getting a little nervous on residential is that how i, I heard on, that? on red on like high-rise development i would say there's there's a little bit of tightness on the credit like just the underwriting's changing um it's just a lot more scrutinized than it was like, you know, before you could present them with a, with a SIM on, you know, here are all the assumptions and, and you, you know, you're getting offers from a handful of, of lenders, I would say. Um, 
I'm not super in touch with the actual brokerage of debt, but you know, I, I have the relationships with the developers. I would say that that Avina works with. Um, but on the we, you know, the couple of commercial projects, like there was one funded right after COVID that was a brick and beam conversion. Again, it's it's not a, a ground up build, so it's a little bit more nuanced, I would say, and a, a lower risk. But you still got to worry about you know the absorption of that office space at the end. And mm -hmm. again, like you just kind of stress test the delay. Okay, what if it takes what if it takes five years to stabilize this thing? You know, if if the covenants are right and they can service the debt in the meantime and the lease up even if it takes forever, you know, it, it's all good, I guess. That's, that's kind of the, the philosophy and, and nobody's really walking from these projects or, or, or like, you know, cup two of those had closed on the acquisition side post COVID. Um, and, and those are offices that could work like that. Maybe you see the, the shift from your, your class A stuff to the, the converted brick and beam because they're bigger floor plates, more spaced out. Like I think this dense, co-working environment is toast and that's going to be it that's going to be like commercial interiors guys are going to be happy i suppose because they're not yeah, be doing all that stuff. yeah there's a good business that's a yeah. good point um oh. but yeah in general like I, ge like general tightening i would say but but more more of it would be on the on the res side because the condo absorption is is a big question mark right now yeah yeah well that, that i mean let's talk about that so i you know i i have been concerned around a number of dynamics have seen in the condo market for a number of years and been you know, quite wrong on that um, because the market's just gone up and to the right. Yeah. Uh, but at some point it just feel, it feels like, okay, so if you do the math, you've got pre-construction, general estimates are something like 70% from day one are investors. You end up about 20% of them that assign. Uh, and so you end up on closing with somewhere around 50% end users and 50% investors. Yeah. Of those 50% investors, about half of them are cash flow negative at completion based on some of the estimates I've seen. And so that puts it at like a quarter of the unit, a quarter of the flow coming to the market is cash flow negative investors. And then on top of that, you layer this big move into, into condo investment from retail investors. You and I were talking about this last year. Like one of the stunning things through 2019 was that we were watching these rental listings for condos just explode on the MLS at the same time that, active listings were plunging yeah. and you talk to any realtor downtown and they, they tell you that, yeah, like every single one of their clients, every one that owned a condo and was trying to trade up to a semi or a detached, whatever it might be, every single one would try to hold the condo as a, as an investment if they could, if they could debt service them. them both. Yeah. And we were seeing that in the data, but yet, you know, the numbers don't seem to make sense. And so, you know, we're looking at potentially two years, 2020 and 2021 of record completions in the condo space. It feels to me like if there's an accident waiting to happen in the market, that's where it'll be. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? And what are you seeing? Yeah, I would, I would agree entirely. And I think that the, the challenge is, is understanding where the bottom is on that. Like, I think that it's even in a no growth environment, projects that sold pre COVID this year at, at record levels are, are in really, really rough shape. And, and I think that there's, there's a degree of concern for developers uh, wondering whether or not they're going to get the next deposit or if people are going to show up and close these units. And you're seeing, uh, you know, launches canceled. Um, you're seeing a lot of projects pivot to purpose-built rental. I would expect that you'll probably see a lot of announcements for that this year. CMHC has been really strong on, on trying to keep that program going. It's a little bit more challenging with the big, big high-rise stuff, but to, so to me, I guess if I was if I were to guess where the bottom is, it's basically where where it doesn't like where it no longer makes sense to for a developer to to bring it to market as a rental. What's the price that they would sell it at just above that? You know where they make a bit to to condo strata. I mean they're all going to be condo strata anyway, but uh, you know to sell it out as a condo unit and and keeping in mind that their capital costs if they're going CMHC insured uh, on the on the purpose-built rental development side is way lower. So like they're, they'd be maybe developing some of these projects at a three, four cap, let's say, no, that might be a bit rich, but let's say a two, three cap. Um, whereas, you know, a condo investor is buying it at a minus two. Right. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's the challenge is, is understanding. And it's really, you have to look at it really granular, like on a, on a site by site basis. Um, but there's definitely some risk there. And then, 
The other piece is, um, I think that the, the step up that you were describing is, is a function of how strong the residential credit creation was. And, and it's also, it looks like the US back in, in 07 where, you know, units, you could borrow that, that, that equity, be it through a private or, or you know, getting a, a, a refi with your existing lender, even on the A side, and take that equity and go deploy it into a house. And, you, and, you, and as long as the underwriting looked okay, that you could service that, that loss, um, and, and afford to live in your home, then you were kind of okay. Um, and, and that's, it's sort of, it was sort of like step up through debt, right? That was very, yeah. that, that's very, a very US in 07 kind of phenomena. And, and, and the challenge is that it really depends on the underlying asset maintaining its value. And that's, that's where things could get probably even more ugly. Cause I think that what you're describing was pretty, pretty common. Like I know, again, anecdotally, a, a good portion of, of, you know, investors or people who are just getting into, let's say their second home were holding a condo and moving into a home in, in the GTA. Yeah. Well, it's not just anecdote. We can see it in the data, right? But yeah. you're right. The anecdotes absolutely corroborate it. And, and every single person I, I spoke with that, that was selling condos downtown was telling me that they were seeing an enormous percent. I had a few of them tell me literally every one of their clients tries to try to do it. Yeah. Uh, and I believe it. You saw it in the numbers, right? Yeah. You, you, um, you must get some pushback from people in your industry though, right? Cause you don't, you strike me as someone who is, you know, completely sensible and grounded in your perspectives, but you obviously have a level of concern around where this market could go. And that would seem to land you on the outside of some of the projections from like Remax and the others that were throwing a lot of shade at some of CMHC's uh, uh, forecasts. Like how, how do you find the reception in the industry when you, you talk bearish the way you are. I mean, I, I would say a lot of people don't love it, but I, I, I mean, I don't, that's my competitive advantage to be honest with you. And I probably lose a lot of business as a result of it, but like clients are entitled to their own investment thesis and I can explain to them, you know, I can show them the information that would allude to whether like, okay, yeah, this points to your thesis being correct. And this points to it being incorrect. I, I always say, you know, it's sort of my job to gather as much information as possible to help people make an informed decision. Um, and as long as I do that, I can sleep at night. And I would say that, you know, the, the people who really, really push back um, and who have argued, and I, you know, you can see it on Twitter and most of these guys, it's a, you know, it's a good friendly banter and whatever, but um, like, I think it's, I think pe some people want to act like it's like sort of socially irresponsible to still be selling when I believe that things are going to decline. But I think it's just as bad to, you know, be selling this dream that, you know, that things are going to go up indefinitely. And my, my philosophy was always just like, look, history would, would prove to us, even with the invention of MMT, that it's just not sustainable. And it's worth explaining that risk to people. And, and usually I could get by with that. I guess like, it's just, it, it's, but yeah, I, I guess I'm a little bit of a black sheep in that respect. My, my dad's been famously bearish forever and he was like hoarding cash before 08. So that, that's sort of like where, where he made his mark. He got really, I guess, lucky or, or correct. Did he, now, did he make the pivot? Was he able to go from bearish to bullish after the, 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 like the 08, 09 downturn? Yeah, but he started getting really bearish again, like in the past, let's say three years, like 17, he was, he was close to spot on for, um, and then lately, I mean, I don't think anybody could predict COVID, but we were all sort of like, okay, this, this looks like 17 again, right? It's like, we can't, yeah. there's no, this is, it, it looked very, very bull trap. Um, and I mean, maybe COVID will be a, a healthy, ultimately look in hindsight, like a, a healthy thing to prevent us from, from really creating real, real problems. But yeah, that's interesting because you're right. The, the numbers I was seeing coming into the year, I was making the case to my clients that you know, you had the resale market, not just in Toronto, but nationally. Toronto, I think, was one of the tightest across the country. But the national numbers, you're looking at 15-year lows in active listings, sales to new listings ratios that were as high as they've been in the last, you know, 10 years, 13 years even. Like 90%. Right the week before COVID was a, a pandemic. It was like a 90% sales to new listing ratio. It was insane, right? And, so, and, and yet, you had prices that in late 2019 and early 2020 – we're up only a couple percent year over year. And you're looking at that going, These are, this is going to be double digits and probably pushing 20% by the summer, yeah. right? Yeah. If something doesn't change. Yeah. 
But you're right. We were absolutely heading back to something that looked pretty frothy again. It's interesting that your uh, your old man was able to make that pivot because that's that's incredibly hard to do. It's very hard to go from being bearish and right to then making the pivot to being bullish. There's not a lot of people that can do that. I'm curious it's, what what does he anchor to to to, to kind of give him that that sense of when to when to shift. It's pretty funny. It's I would say just gut, man. Like honestly, he's uh he's he's he was like a tool and die design guy by trade, and then just worked his way up from sweeping floors at Hyundai to, you know, to work to being um in their in their commercial real estate space, uh, sort of at, at the end of his his um, corporate career. Mm-hmm. And, and, like you always ask him, and he doesn't really have any metrics to go by. But and so it's it's just funny that uh, you know that is, he's is it sentiment? To... Like does he does he just kind of gauge general market sentiment, or is yeah, it I would like say he's literally always on the phone with people. Like he's. You, you like he's basically on the phone all day and I think he just really gets a good idea of what like just aggregating that kind of feeling in the market and 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 he thinks about it because like that's what he, he knows he knows people he doesn't like have the you know the, the education that you and I do but he, he can see okay you know if certain people are worrying or, or stressed he does have a lot of rental units as well and I think he kind of uses that and once he starts to see the stress there he's like okay this is kind of where the bottom could, could the, the rug could get pulled out a little bit that's interesting that's interesting. Yeah, so. I would trade. I would trade all of my education for that sort of market, yeah, market insight and that you know that ability to. Oh, I'll have to have you up. Uh, I have to have you up on the lake, and uh, and you guys can. Well, I'm not far away from them. Yeah, when you're up there next. Yeah, we were talking beforehand that we, yeah, your family's got the place not too far from where I am. But yeah, I, I'll I'll bring the boat over. We're gonna do some fishing or skiing yeah. or whatever. So yeah, for sure. You could. Uh, he's an interesting cat. That's for sure. I've learned a lot from him. That's cool. Man. But, you know, naturally, a lot of those 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 guys are pretty tough to work with. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. That's 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 the joy of working with family. I'd imagine. <laughs> uh, you Close you mentioned uh, like when we were talking a little bit about the U.S. stuff, and and I, like it's sort of back to the be- very beginning of the the conversation, but how you know our debt had kind of got it, it inflated our household debt, and then now with the savings rate being so low. I I have this curiosity around the resilience of the Canadian banking system by comparison to the U S right? Like in the U S you have 2000 institutions and, and in Canada, you've got, let's say six, and then sort of your, you know, your non non-bank financial institutions that, that do play a big role. Um, but one of the things that I noticed early on in COVID and again, anecdotally, but some of the deals that I was bringing in for the Avena guys were, getting funded more and more by or getting offers, let's say more and more by foreign groups that were further ahead in the COVID curve than, than we were. So uh, what do you Korea, mean by that? When you say offers from foreign groups, so f- funding from foreign banks, yeah, foreign lenders. Yeah. So, <laughs> you yeah. So like a deal that would, that we, you know, uh, maybe it would be an AB structure on land, you know, you'd get a, a, a big six and then, you know, one of your mix or something like that. Um, I can't really think of a good example of I, well nobody that I could really talk about, but but there was two groups, one from China and one from Korea, very early on in COVID, where well in Canada's COVID, where they had sort of had their peak, let's call it, or what they had thought was the peak, and and they were already running the skeleton crews in the office. They saw what um, you know what a post-COVID world looked like, let's say, and they they were really opportunistic for Canadian lending deals like uh, like lending on Canadian real estate deals I thought that it was strange but I, the other piece was that at the same time you're seeing Canadian credit tighten on the commercial side like because of COVID happening and I guess you know the, the question here is do you think that there's a, a, a degree of systemic vulnerability to foreign groups coming in and, and starting to play a, a really really meaningful role in the lending space in, in Canadian real estate, um, if if things stay tight and, and if the banks start suffering as a result of, you know, uh, delinquency or defaults or like, what what, what does this look like for our, our, our banking system? Sorry, man, I was muted oh, there. Good, man. Around. Sorry about that. No. <laughs> So I, I wouldn't put myself out as a, as a bank analyst. It's not right. necessarily what I do. I do have a view on how the banks fare in this downturn. And, and you know, I am concerned about them. First of all, I don't think we're talking about a systemic risk necessarily. I don't think we're going to be there right. talking about, you know, 
is Royal Bank a going concern, right? That's not, that's not going to be the conversation. Um, but I am concerned on a number of fronts. I mean, it, it gets a little into the weeds that, that maybe you're, I don't know how far your viewers want to, want to chase that. But when you look at things like how the banks calculate the risk-weighted assets and how that in turn um, plays into some of their, their, their leverage ratios, it, you know, a lot of that's calculated on a backwards looking basis over the last five years, right? Where, you know, our experience in Canada has been very shallow recessions, um, really for the last 20 years, right? Any recession that we've had has been relatively quick and relatively shallow. And if that's your, what, the, the inputs in your models, then when you hit a scenario like we're in today, all of a sudden you realize that, oh, your risk weights are wrong, right? And, uh, and that's problematic. Now, again, I don't think that's, I think there's a lot of differences between say Canada and the US. I'm always hesitant to draw these sort of straight line parallels. The underwriting is obviously better in Canada than it was in the US, clearly. Sure. And anybody who suggests otherwise just doesn't, you know, hasn't really looked at that situation. Now, there are some idiosyncrasies in, in terms of the structure of mortgage finance in Canada that, that, is, that is strange and riskier in some ways. So for example, you know, I'm not a fan of this growing private mortgage market. I know it's always been there. I'm fine with it conceptually, but you know, more and more people using these one year bullet loans where the source of funding is these mom and pop investors, right? That were, that could in theory be flighty capital. We've already seen a number of these mortgage investment corporations have had to gate redemptions. Yeah. That's a, that's a dynamic that, you know, that, that's like a bull market dynamic. That's the sort of thing that just doesn't work. In, in, a, in an environment of falling valuations and tightening liquidity. Yeah. And it's not clear to me how that's gonna play out. So there are these sort of like pinch points in the structure of the Canadian credit ecosystem that, that, are, that create vulnerabilities, right? Another one is home equity lines of credit, right? And I've spent a lot of time thinking about this and reading about it and writing about it. But if you look in the US, home equity lines of credit, if you normalize it to GDP, and this is drawn balances, they peaked in 2006 at around four and a half percent of GDP. Right. Today in Canada, we're over 13%. And the reason that that strikes me as a vulnerability is, you know, the vast majority of that is, uh, is interest only, right? That's the whole appeal of, of home equity lines of credit is that they're interest only. If you want to amortize it, then you would, you'd be better off refinancing it because you get a lower rate, right? Doing a, a mortgage refi. Uh, and so, you know, it's not clear to me that banks will always allow that or that OSFI will always allow that to just be perpetually interest only, non-amortizing with no fixed term. It seems likely that at some point the regulator is going to say, okay, you know, we will let you have an interest only period, but then after a couple of years, we want this to start being paid down. Right. And, and, and more to the point, if there was a, a real dislocation in the market where prices really started to fall and lenders got nervous, you know, people talk about in the U.S., one of the things that sank the market were these 228 option arm resets, where it was a 228, two-year, and the 28-year uh, uh, adjustable rate mortgage, right? That's the arm. And so after a couple of years, they would reset to a higher rate, and it was this huge payment shock. And I've kind of always made the case that, like, in some ways, the HELOC market in Canada is like this massive option arm, but it would only reset in a really bad environment where the banks go, geez, you know what? We lent to 65% loan to value, but we're not even sure that that's going to cover us if this guy goes delinquent, right? Uh, and so maybe we would be smart, smart to start amortizing this. So like there are some vulnerabilities there, but the one difference among many, you know, one being that you could pull all the CEOs into one room and, you know, talk, talk about lending standards and, and, and options for the system, whatever, you can't do that in the U.S. because to your point, you've got thousands of institutions. But also, you know, in the U.S., you saw prices come off about 30% over 18 months, which is a tremendous decline, in ter even in terms of like global house price declines. That's, that's really rare to see prices fall that quick. Normally, prices are relatively sticky. And really, the only way that you see prices fall that fast and that much is if you have credit completely freeze up. Right. And that's what happened in the US. The entire funding dynamic was broken. Um, and in Canada, the one thing that people forget is that you have a lot of front end control over the, the financing, at least, yeah. because tomorrow you could have Bill Morneau 
unilaterally as the finance minister come out and say, okay, we're going to give CMHC a trillion dollar insurance cap and we're going to make sure that every loan gets funded and every mortgage gets renewed and there's no, do you know what I mean? And the credit will flow. They're going to, they could put it on the sovereign balance sheet without even a parliamentary debate. Yeah. Right. And that's very different than in the U S. So, you know, you, you could, you could talk about, you know, would it matter if there's an enormous recession, and job losses, you know, will, will people take that credit anyways? I don't know. But the point is they can keep that credit flowing. And without that dynamic, it's really hard to get the sort of declines that we saw in the U S. Right. So there's a degree of like re resilience there just by the accessibility that the, the connectedness that let's say the big six have with uh, that, like you said, CMHC and the sovereign balance sheet. Like even if we start to see tightening, like CMHC is talking about right now, I mean, really just a protection mechanism right yeah well that's it i mean if the if if the rubber hits the road you, know, you can bet if it, if it comes down to a, a scenario where prices start falling so much that uninsured mortgages you know the banks start to reconsider whether they want to refinance them yeah. or re, or renew them i should say uh, which is not out of the realm of possibility right um, but if you got into that sort of a scenario then you would see something come out from the feds to, to, right. to put that risk on the sovereign balance sheet. And they can do that very, very quickly and very easily. And so at the very, at the very least, it sort of keeps a lot of the, you know, extreme forced selling to a minimum. And the other thing is there are recourse laws in Canada. I'm not a huge fan. Everybody always says, well, you know, you can't walk away from your home in Canada. Uh, and so, you know, that's a big difference from the U S but people often forget that, you know, there's a lot of recourse jurisdictions internationally that were absolutely decimated in 08, 09. I mean, Spain and Ireland yeah. had way more stringent recourse laws. Florida and Nevada have pretty strong recourse laws and they were decimated. Yeah. So I'm not a huge believer that that matters, right. except okay, it matters. Let me reframe it. Uh, it matters unless you have this incredible, enormous shock to, to, to the macro backdrop, right? Barring something like a once in a hundred year recession, yeah. That does matter. But at the end of the day, you can't squeeze blood from a stone. And there's no evidence that uh, that recourse matters in those sorts of you know, severe economic circumstances. Are we is there a chance we see a, a, a once in a hundred year recession? Then I mean, well, it could be right. Yeah. You know, that goes back to the original discussion. Nothing's off the table. That's the crazy part in all this is that this is a once in a hundred year recession. Yeah. If it were not for the incredible fiscal support. Yeah. Right. So you know, they've done a lot to put a floor under things. It's not clear to me that it will be enough or that, you know, they can continue to, or that there will there, be willingness to do this indefinitely. At some point you have to take the pain, yeah. right? There, there is something about, you know, we do live in a capitalist society. I know that capitalists and it sort of, you know, is a bad word these days, but, but the whole principle there is that you do let the businesses fail that are the weakest and you sort of call the herd and yeah. you consolidate and you come out of it stronger the other side. Yeah, I guess you that, need that's the way it's supposed to work. Yeah, I guess you need a bit of that Darwinism there. Like that's 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 part of the function of it. Um, on on that note, oh, there was something that you mentioned in there that I was I was really eager to to respond to, but I, my brain's obviously shutting off with the. Yeah, I talk too much. That's my problem. You get no, no, no. It's, long, it's uh, I, no. I, um, what I mean, so what what is outside? Like, or I guess the first piece is what are the externalities of what you're describing like if like at what point do we have to pay for is it going to be you know a huge tax issue in the future like you know th th there are costs associated with what's happening right? oh definitely how do we does that like does that create a longevity to the the pain that we're seeing right now and in, in such without a doubt. yeah and, without then, a doubt. and what risks exist beyond those externalities i guess i don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that well that's uh, so that's going to be the big debate coming out of this on the other side is you know when you're in the midst of a crisis like this in in some cases what's that saying where it's like the the perfect is the enemy of the good or something like that yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's so right when you're in the midst of these uh, midst of these crises is that you don't need a perfect policy response, but you need one that's quick and that's big, yeah. right? And that's, and that's what Canada did. Like, to their yeah. credit, they got money into people's hands very quickly, yeah. right? And, and, and that is the right approach. Now, at some point, the discussion needs to turn to, well, what does this look like coming on the other side of this? I mean, yeah. 
we're talking about running budget deficits that are well into double digits of GDP. Right? Yeah. And you, know, you can't sustain that forever. Right? No. Uh, and so, yeah, there's, it's going to have to be repaid via higher taxes. It just will. And so, yeah, there is a, there's a cost to, to all of this, but you know, I, I think unless you're just a, one of these like super diehard free market guys, it's like a, let everybody yeah, yeah. just burn, let the place burn. And you just love watching the world burn. Then yeah. you have to recognize that this is the lesser of the evils, right? Because we were facing something that was pretty catastrophic I and mean, there would have been, I mean, it's hard to imagine how many businesses would have failed, how many people would have gone bankrupt if the government hadn't stepped in in the way that they had. So there will be, there will be ramifications coming out of this. Now, one of the things I, I wonder longer term, if you sort of take a step back, and this is more high level and sort of global, but I do think coming out of this, so first of all, for the next, at least the next year, and probably a couple of years, we're going to have just tremendous deflationary pressures. Right. And people are wrong about this. Everyone's always like, well, there's so much money printing in the world. The bank, you look at the bank Canada's balance sheet. Yeah, yeah. That's not the right way to think about it. Right. I mean, if you, if you take a couple that were making a hundred thousand dollars and then their income gets cut in half and then the government steps in and tops it back up to a hundred thousand, well, is that inflationary? Well, no, there's no increased propensity to spend there. Right. They've literally just filled a, a hole that was yeah. blown out by the, by the coronavirus, Right. right. So none of this spending is inflationary. It's like plugging the hole that's there. It's trying to top up the lost income, right. not inflationary. And it's not going to be inflationary for a couple of years. But on the other side of this, there's a number of things that I think will potentially be quite inflationary and, and not inflationary in a, in a good way. In, in some ways, I think you could see that, you know, the, the uh, repatriating of some of the supply chains. Yeah. Uh, which I think is absolutely going to be a thing. Yeah, right? yeah. The decline in globalization, all of these things, the end of just-in-time inventory management, uh, yeah. all of these things that have been tremendous cost savings to consumers for so many years, we have to give a serious rethink of that coming out of this. And, and it will pressure prices. I mean, I would say, you know, like structurally, this is a, this is a change that's not, that's not coming back. I think that the globalized world that we had coming into this was already – pretty precarious if you looked at what was happening with global trade and some of the yeah. conflicts internationally. Yeah. And this is the death now. I mean, it's just not coming back. It's not going back to how it was before. And so there are repercussions on the inflationary front. The other thing I worry about is I do think there's a risk when we talk about just how much more precarious the household balance sheet is here in Canada yeah. it, and not just the balance, the household, but also the corporate balance sheet. Right. People forget how levered Canadian non-financials are. And it argues to me that we're going to need tremendously low rates in Canada vis-a-vis -vis our international peers for a long time on the other side of this. And it's almost like there's no way that this doesn't get vented through the currency in my mind. I, I think the, the Canadian dollar is going to just bleed out from here. And so there is a chance that in addition to all the dynamics we just talked about, that you also, all the stuff that we import, it's going to get more expensive coming out of this. So this is not a concern for, for today, but, you know, I do worry that that one of the repercussions of all this would be a, a more inflationary backdrop on the other side. And I've been the guy that for years has been like, no, no, rates are going lower, rates are going lower. There's a deflationary backdrop, you know, and I, I, I feel like finally there's a light at the end of that. And you right. can now see a clear pathway to higher inflation coming out of this on a more sustained basis. Does that mean we stay low or do you think there's room to go? I think they have to stay low. I think, I mean, this is the problem, right? Like, I do think when this when this settles out, you're going to see negative real interest rates in Canada for a long time. So inflation adjusted, they, they're going to have to stay really low. Which you know, in as much as I'm negative on 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 housing, uh, that's actually a very positive environment for housing for any real asset, right? And so, like, there will be a time. All of this depends on the magnitude of the the downturn that we're facing. Um, because if it's not, if it's not s steep, then none of this really matters. Right. But, but if, if it ends up being sort of as bad as it looks at the, at the moment, there'll be some sort of reckoning for real estate. And then you're going to enter into uh, an environment that's very supportive of any real asset, right? Negative real rates globally. But I think you have to have very negative real rates in Canada for a long time, right? Just to plug the hole. Yeah. On the, on the housing side, the, how does that take shape? Like what are the mechanics of, the, of that decline from your perspective? Like, is it 
the I've always said that the, I feel the greatest vulnerability is that frothiness that you're seeing in these in the in the pre-construction. Like it's just it looks too similar to the 2017 pre-cons that we're selling. You know, with with your um, your completion target price, let's say uh, priced in, and then you know guys flipping the paper in the line at the sales office and blah blah blah. Yeah. Um, and and the condo environment looks very similar to that, uh, but you also have like really really strong institutions that are doing this high rise stuff. Like these guys are no joke, right? Um, and, and so I'm wondering, like, I, I guess how 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 and and my big big question is at what point does the condo, if if we do start to see in core condos, especially in Toronto, I mean that's basically what I'd be speaking about. If we do start to see declines, you know, even a 2019 uh, launch product. Um, at what point, who, who bears the risk there? It's, it's probably not the lender. If it's a big six, is it the deposit insurer? Like I've heard, I've heard of some of the, the equity guys that we work with talking about how some of these deposit insurers are going to be bankrupt by the end of the year. And I'm like, who, I don't who does the deposit insurance? I can't remember the name insurance? of the company now. Uh, you got to find out for me. Cause that, I didn't realize there were deposit and, insurers. Are they publicly traded? <laughs> it's like I'm looking so, at um, give me a sec here. I'll, I'll try and pull it up. But basically the way that the capital stack works is like you get a, a deposit and then it's insured and then you're able to borrow against that deposit once it's insured. Right. So you can lever that. <laughs> oh, interesting. So, so a developer basically puts up the, the when, say, when it's insured, what, what specifically is it insured against? It's insured against the, the, the chance that the borrower doesn't, the bo the it's, it's for both sides. So it's, it's, uh, I, it's, I think it's West something. Give me a, um, Oh, we'll, we'll follow up offline, man. Yeah, yeah, for we'll, sure. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that sounds really interesting. Yeah, it'd be a good, uh, it'd be a good, um, dialogue to have. Uh, and so just to, sorry, just to back up. So they, they pay out if the project doesn't complete or if the borrower doesn't make subsequent deposits. I think it's, well, I don't know if it would be a, on the subsequent, but I think if they fail to close. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, but, and if they fail to close, then, but then they would pay out only if there's a deficiency after the, the developer resells it, right? On, to the, to the uh, purchaser, like to the, the end user purchaser? Yeah, so, okay, so bu Buddy walks into pre-sale office, uh, contracts to buy or to, to, to yeah buy this unit for seven hundred thousand, completing in twenty twenty two. Yeah, right. Twenty twenty two. It's West Mount, around. by the way. West Mount is the company. West Mount. I'm gonna have to look into that. But twenty twenty two rolls around. Prices now are five hundred thousand in the resale market because we've been through a you know catastrophic recession. Let's say. Yeah. And uh, Buddy decides he doesn't want to close and walks away. Now in that environment, then the developer would have to uh, take the unit, sell it. They also have legal recourse back to the to the original buyer, yeah. Um, but I guess the the insurer would pay out the deficiency if they don't collect it, or I guess I got to figure out how that all works. I do too, actually. To be honest with you, I haven't seen it happen. Knock on wood. No, well, no yeah. one would have seen it. it. It was probably a great business for a lot of years, right? Insuring yeah. against that risk because there was no risk, but now all of a sudden there is, right? That's yeah. the problem with insuring anything that's that's dependent on sort of the credit environment. Is that like the concept of credit insurance? in my mind, does not make sense. It's actually a fundamentally broken business model. And a lot of people disagree with me on this, but like, if you think about it, the concept of insurance is that the risk is, uh, is mutually exclusive and poolable, right? In other words, you know, the, the risk that I crash my car is not correlated to the risk that you crash your car or that the guy in BC crashes his car, right? Yeah. But when it comes to anything related to credit, that doesn't work because, because you know, it, it affects the national picture, interest rates and right. recessions. Right? You can't pool credit risk, right? Which is why, like, you have these long histories of any of these credit insurers. They make money. They make money for years and years and years. And then in one year, they give back. They lose more yeah. money than they've made over the last 30 years, and they're bankrupt. Yeah. And it's like that happens over and over and over again. Right? Yeah. And so what you're describing is a form of credit credit insurance that, sounds like it's a business model that just makes money until all of a sudden it loses money and then it blows up spectacularly. Yeah. And I guess that's the question that I have is like, is it, if, if the developer, if these are insured, cause it's like Terry on bonds, right? Like it's against like, so it's a home builder's insurance. So 
um, it, it's, it's not the developer that loses and I guess it's not the lender that loses, but I, I mean, at, at a certain point, if that, if that insurer, like you described, if they, if they're gone, like, because I think it's at the scale at which it, it, to my knowledge, there's very few institutions doing this that, you know, they could get wiped out pretty quickly if this happened at, at scale. Um, yeah. then, then what happens when, when that, that, well, that piece of the puzzle thing. goes missing, right? Well, you gave me something I got to dig into. I, I don't know that dynamic well enough. And I guess I need to, is that, I'm gonna, uh, uh, yeah, no, it's a good one. I mean, I, I'd love to do some research with you on it. I, I'm going to send you a, a little infographic. I just pulled up while I was on, uh, on Twitter and then, uh, maybe we can resume the discussion afterwards. hundred percent. hundred percent. But you would ask, you'd sort of ask what, what this is likely to look like. And yeah, you know, I, I think if you think about like where it's probably going to show up first and what the potential progressions are, it's very clear to me this is going to bleed out in the rental market first. You're going to see issues in the rental market. You're already seeing prices decline in the rental market in the major yeah. metros. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think that's a temporary thing. I don't think this is just a quick couple months from Airbnb units flooding the market and then we're back to normal. Because as I said, it's a lot of supply in the pipeline. And I think that population growth numbers are going to be dramatically weaker than people realize. Uh, and so I think that's an issue. And so that then raises potentially the risk of some of these investors selling or you know, or it just, you know, just saps demand from, from the, the ownership pool, because if rents are falling, what's the incentive and prices are flat or falling modestly, what's the incentive to jump into the, to the ownership pool? And so, you know, it ends up that household formations are low to begin with, but they're especially low for anyone that's looking to own. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, there will be a, some unknown quantum of owners that are going to have to sell at some point later this summer in the fall, we don't know what that's gonna look like, but not everybody's gonna be made whole coming up the other side of this. And some people will be forced to, to sell. We saw already, you know, the anecdotes are starting to come in. That sob story about the girl with $30,000 yeah. interest rate payment penalty. Yeah. Uh, she had to sell because, uh, you know, COVID uh, just interrupted her income. She's not alone, right? No. So, you know, but again, getting back to our earlier discussion, the, the good thing that Toronto has is that coming into this, they're in such a position of strength, right? The market was so well balanced that, you know, this is a story for later this year, or more likely 2021, before you start to find out what prices are going to do. It's very different than a place like Alberta, where you came into this with eight or nine months of inventory. Yeah. Right? Very different, because there the wheels can fall off and are falling off like day one, right? But I guess my, my the philosophy would be also that, the, you know, the, the vulnerability to a shift like you have a lot of things happening at the same time right like you have investors now finally realizing that fundamentals actually matter you know it's not like this isn't the silicon valley of real estate where you can just lose money and, and it'll still go up in value and the fundamentals are eroding too right so like they're chasing a bottom that's that's moving down at the same time like i at least in where i'm seeing in york region you know we're seeing a huge excess supply scenario evolving like way more listings and sales coming online uh, days on markets growing, sales to new listing ratio declining, like that could very easily take shape as a long, like it, it doesn't concern me today so much, but I, I think you're seeing a lot of preemptive entry from the seller side of people who are like anticipating and, and saying, okay, I can't, you know, I might be in trouble or I think the market's in trouble and I'm going to move this now rather than when yeah. the flood starts, right? Or rather That's interesting. But I, I think I think across the whole city, though, I think that the numbers for May are showing that I think sales were down less than new listings. Hold on, sales were down less. Than, yeah. Hold on, let me think about that. It's it's pretty micro. It varies market to market. Like it, on the yeah. GTA, I'm not so much sure. I, like I the know. market tightened is what I'm trying yeah. to say. The market yeah. looks better than it did a month ago. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. 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 And but but I think I think what's going to happen and to your point, like it's going to be micro, but it's also going to be based on segment. Like I do think the the segments that will get hit hardest is uh, the condo market, where it's skewed heavier towards short term rentals and just investors generally, uh, because I do think there could be a shakeout there. But the other thing that you tend to see when liquidity dries up is the high end of the market, the the luxury market gets very weak, right? Uh, and and that's that, those are generally the two areas that get compressed, right? The, anywhere where you've got a lot of investment, so call that the condo market, and then the luxury market. If you're, if you're looking, you know, so let's, let's assume that you see, let's say CMHC is right, you see 10 to 15% moth in Toronto. Right. Probably that's gonna translate into something like 20% off for condos, 20, 25% off for anything priced over three or four million. 
Yeah. And that middle ground where you've got like, you know, single family, entry level, sub a, a million or sub a million five along transit corridors, they probably hold up fine, like maybe down five, 10%, right? So yeah. it's going to be very different. Um, but the big unknown as well, again, back to what we talked about earlier, is just how this changes people's thinking around the whole urban suburban mix and whether people still gravitate towards the density. I, I thought that was sort of a crazy thought a couple months ago. And I'm not so sure now. I, there, there could be some legs to that narrative. Yeah. I, I, on the topic of Ipsos polls, actually, they had one like just before COVID happened that basically, you know, the majority of, uh, of boomers want to move into, into rural areas and then the majority of, of millennials want to move into urban areas. I mean, nobody's really surprised by that. But what, you know, what it told me was, okay, we're one generation away from like once all the boomers die, then basically everybody's going to want to live in, in urban areas. And there's no hypothesis that, people in my generation are going to change their sentiment. Like what, mm. uh, it's like, Oh, they're just going to live in condos forever, even when they have kids yeah. and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, I mean, people are forgetting about the natural progression of life. Right. I think, yeah. I think one of the other looming factors is like, there's a lot of, uh, of boomers who own big houses in the city or in, in pretty urban areas that there's like not buyers for. So that's where I don't know if I would agree on the mid market, like that, that product, that sort of, you know, eight to two million range is is as safe maybe i would agree like with the current dynamic with covid and everything i think it's it's more resilient but i think it's it it, it is going to have some challenges further down the line yeah. when you see that migration because like if if covid becomes a thing you know or even for like a couple of, of years you know the 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 ones who are at risk are going to be less inclined to live in an urban area right like it just makes their life hard yeah and, and so it, i don't know that piece is just I, I guess that's one where you kind of just have to watch it evolve right yeah yeah no it's fair it's a fair point listen man we, none of us have any idea we're all just yeah throwing darts and yeah for sure and that's the best part though man that's why i love theorizing about it uh because yeah. like, you, know, you can't really be wrong here everyone's wrong um is there anything you wanted to, to, to cover that we didn't really get to? I know I didn't really stick to the script, but like we kind of just we good. started off pretty strong. So I, I've, I've just been really interested. Oh, man, it's good. I'm, I, I, there's nothing that uh, is like burning that uh, – I don't know who your general viewer would be anyways, but there's nothing that's like – Yeah, it's pretty all over the map, man. I'm kind of in the infancy of this whole content thing. So it's been like, I don't know, I get just really, really random guys. I don't know. Like I even have some, some, some big investment uh, – like big guys in the in the finance space watching which is pretty random and then sure. all the way down to like you know a, a first-time home buyer yeah sure sure yeah. that's great yeah no there's nothing that i'd say i you know i i just i guess the uh my bias as, as it has been for a while is that uh you know there's a lot more risk in this market than general people perceive and uh and that's everything from you know the household balance sheets to the structure of credit yeah uh, to the composition of the economy and how how much we've levered that off of this housing and consumption boom yeah uh that i it's just it's hard for me to see how we unwind this painlessly but i've been wrong before uh so we'll see we'll see i guess a lot of it depend on just how much mr trudeau wants to just keep spending and how much people are willing to you know get behind that yeah hmm. I guess it'd be interesting to see it take shape um if uh if people want to reach out to you um what's the best place to do it uh via twitter okay. at ben rabidu I'm sure we can show we can you, yeah i put it in the uh, show yeah, yeah. yeah link, link it there uh i do have a website northcove.net uh if you are an institutional investor um and have an interest in covering some of these these macro trends or having somebody covering it for you then uh you know you can go online and uh, check out some of the sample research that's that's on the website and on, if, on that stuff do you typically do like is that is that like uh, commission work or is it like do you have a subscription service that people pay you yeah, for it's a subscription service and it's it's institutionally priced so it's not it's not one that uh works for for most retail investors or even most developers i've talked to but uh yeah, i keep a relatively small distribution um so that i am free to you know to, to do some of that um, you know, some of that, uh, bespoke work when I, when it's requested. So uh, that's fun, man. I like the model yeah. for sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I really appreciate your time and, uh, and giving me the extra half hour outside of the Google calendar invite there. It's, it's, yeah, uh, it's all good. It's always uh, good. No, it, was, it was really yeah. fun, man. I, I was, I, I was, uh, I've been really wanting to pick your brain for a while. So I'm, I'm glad to finally have the opportunity. I, I appreciate your time. And I think it's going to, going to at least, uh, raise a lot of, uh, a lot of 
interesting questions for a lot of people right now. Well, I hope so. That's the name of the game right now. Well, all of us are, you know, just trying to figure out what in the world is going to happen next. None of us have a crystal ball. So, you know, your guess is good as mine, but that's how we get smarter is just bounce ideas off of people. For sure, man. For sure. Okay, buddy. All right, Dan. Thanks again for your time, man. Have a good night. Yeah, you too.